Indonesia's island of Sumatra is the sixth largest island in the world and one of the most unique ecosystems on the planet. It's home to some of the rarest plant and animal species in existence. You will never find another place anywhere that is home to tigers, rhinos, elephants, and orangutans in the same landscape. It is also one of the most vulnerable to deforestation. Around 14 million hectares of forests have been cleared in the past 31 years, or put another way, nearly 56% of it. Sumatra is the epicenter of palm oil plantations, illegal logging, poaching, and a few other key deforestation drivers that are making this critically endangered landscape all the more difficult to conserve and protect, and the timeline to save it is incredibly sobering. My name is Mike DiGirolamo, your host for Manga Bay Explores, a special podcast series from MangaBay.com's global team, where I speak with experts from the field working to protect the critically threatened forests and animals of Sumatra. Join me bi-weekly as I dive into the unique beauty and key issues this one-of-a-kind landscape and the people working to protect it face. This week, I spoke with Rudy Putra and Greg McCann, Putra is a biologist and chairman of the Loser Conservation Forum, a world-renowned activist, and a Goldman Environmental Prize recipient. He has been working to conserve the Loser ecosystem for over two decades. Greg McCann is a modern-day explorer, working for the People Resources and Conservation Foundation in the Hatabuan Hills, Dolok, Similaloxa landscape. I spoke at length with McCann and Putra to distill the magic that is Sumatra and to talk about some of their conservation and restoration efforts which Rudy has been working on for more than a decade, and also Greg's proposed wildlife corridor. Like the Loser ecosystem, the answers to some of these questions are complex, nuanced, and at times mystifying. But both Putra and McCann were adamant about one thing, that Sumatra is a -a one-of-a-kind beauty, and we are running out of time to protect it. Rudy's work is mostly in what is referred to as the Loser ecosystem, which is one of the least known forest systems on the planet and the last place on Earth where the Sumatran rhino, tiger, elephant, and orangutan coexist in one place. And it is also the food and water source for millions of Indonesians. I'm working for the conservation since 2000 or 20 years ago. My background is biology and my village in we call it Tamiang, the area in the east coast of Aceh province, northern Sumatra. In our village, in early 80s, that is the logging <clears throat> operation there. Not really in our village, but uh, I can see in the every every day the log flow to the river from the the upstream of the the, the concession, so very big logging in that time, and I feel so very sad because uh, why we have to cut down the the tree. I work for the Loser Management Unit, so this the institution for the managing the Loser ecosystem, 2.6 million hectares in Aceh and North Sumatra. So after uh, working with the Leuser Management Unit, I continue my work at the Leuser International Foundation and until 2007, and then continue to Leuser Management Authority under government of Aceh until 2012. Because this institution is meddling by the new governor at that time, and in the end of 2012, we establishing our NGO called Leuser Conservation Forum. And until today, until March uh, this year, 2020, I am a director of the Leuser Conservation Forum. And since March until today, as the board of trustee of the Leuser Conservation Forum. Rudy modestly omitted that he was directly responsible for helping to dismantle many illegal palm oil plantations in the Loser ecosystem. Because of this work, he was honored in 2014 with the Goldman Environmental Prize. I don't know about the the prize uh, before someone called me, but they said this prize because my work for Loser ecosystem, and especially for the Sumatran rhino, and working for the restoring their habitat, especially how we can restore the ecosystem, uh, illegal palm oil to be forest. My work for this work first is monitor what happened in, in the user ecosystem 
And then I have to try how we can reclaim the forest loss and restore the forest. So that's why I have to work with the many parties, many government and authorities, and including the local communities, how we can stop these illegal activities and uh, we can claim and restore the forest. So they said this is uh, my one, uh, but it's not really my one because uh, we're working together along the NGOs and communities and government. And that time, this is really like a factory because uh, it's almost impossible we can restore the palm oil because palm oil is the one of the largest uh, economic driver in Indonesia and controlled by, by a rich person. But we can because we work together. Illegal palm oil continues to be a major problem in many areas around the world, but it is very concentrated in Sumatra, and in particular, the Loser ecosystem, which contains nearly 200 mammal and 500 bird species, many endemic to the region. The Loser ecosystem is really, in, in Sumatra, a really unique ecosystem uh, because this is consists of, the, I think, around the 25 million hectares land in here and until 1980s this is still huge of forests everywhere in 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 sumatra from the high subalpine until the lowland forest and coastal area so really unique and differs uh, with the bio biodiversity high biodiversity and also the interesting here because of sumatra the second largest economic in island Indonesia after Java and the forest lost very fast in here and we lost the ecosystem and many species endemic in Sumatra and and we lost of the many species also in here like uh, Sumatran rhino, uh, elephant, orangutan and tiger and for the orangutan this is really only in Sumatra uh, they live because in Kalimantan, it's uh, another species, but orangutan Sumatra only in, in Sumatra Island and also in, in northern area. I also asked Greg McCann what made Sumatra so valuable and unique to the world. And he pointed out for that almost all of humanity, Sumatra has been untouched with a very low population density. Only in the past 50 to 60 years has this not been the case, which has given us a window into a world that was almost entirely devoid of human activity. And we can still see the remnants of robust forest that is unmatched anywhere else on the planet. Sumatra is like this leftover land. It's like this fossil attic of rare species, which, you know, they, they, it's always had, up until recently, it's always had a very low population, human population density. You know, large scale deforestation didn't start until maybe about 50, 60 years ago there. If you look at it, it's almost like the shape of a rhinoceros horn. It's just this giant rhino horn shaped island blanketed in the richest rainforest you can imagine. And so in the, in the po human population there was low. So I think speciation continued to occur for a long time there. And there were just rare, unknown species living there all the way up until recent times. I mean, I mean, there's just nothing like it. Just the, the richest rainforest in the world. Yeah, you do, we just have these fragments of that really rich past remaining. The landscape where I work is one of these last relics, one of these last relic landscapes, a refugia for wildlife, which had nowhere else to go but to flee to these mountains there. Greg has been working in the Hadabwan Hills, Dolok Similaloxa landscape, camera trapping for endangered species. Unlike the Losar ecosystem, this land is not protected, and Greg and his team were determined to demonstrate it was home to many animals previously thought to not live there. Our project is down in these mountains south of Toba, which, were, um, which are really not a protected area at all. They've got almost no protected status. They were totally unsurveyed. And, you know, there were rumors uh, that there were tigers in there and um, tapirs and stuff like that, critically endangered and endangered species, and we wanted to find out. So even with, with just like six camera traps, we very quickly found tiger and tapir, which was an indication to me that you know, this place was still home to some of the rarest and you know, most critically endangered and beautiful megafauna on the planet. 
And I think this, these kind of places can only exist in Sumatra. Sumatra is the only place where there could be like a group of mountains which no, where no one works, and there may be critically endangered species hanging on in there. I mean, even when you're like driving a car down the road in Sumatra, and you see like some like a group of low hills in the distance, and the, and the tops of maybe the top 15, 20% are forested, there's probably gibbons in there. Rudy went into more detail about the species of animals located in Sumatra and how this differs from the rest of Indonesia, also highlighting just how important the Loser ecosystem is to Southeast Asia and to the rest of the world. Another unique, Sumatra still has iconic species like a tiger, elephant, rhino, and, and orangutan, and also another big mammal. This is quite different than another island in uh, Indonesia, because in Kalimantan there is no tiger there, and uh, small elephant and small of the, the rhino and also the orangutan in in Sumatra that is different with the orangutan in Kalimantan from the the color of the, the hair and also their behavior so Sumatra quite interesting for, for me so leaves are one of the largest the largest uh, remaining forest in Southeast Asia, no, and only in this place where the rhino, tiger, orangutan, and elephant coexist together in one landscape. There is no place in our earth this four species uh, we can find this four species in one landscape. Only in lizard ecosystem. That's really unique. By now, you may be wondering just how much time we have left before we lose all this unique biodiversity. The answer depends on what is being lost and where, but Rudy says, for everything in Sumatra, we have no more than 15 years. So we estimate in next maybe 10 or 15 years, we will lose of the Sumatran elephant. And in next 10 years, maybe we lose of the uh, Sumatran rhino without any intervention, serious intervention from the government and also conservationists in Sumatra because we can see the dramatical forest loss in Sumatra. We lost so many forests in southern part of the Sumatra and we lost so many elephants there, uh, also tiger. For example, in Riau, it's very teeny forest right now there because uh, they come back to palm oil. And so estimates only, yeah, in next 15 years, we lost everything in, in, in Sumatra, except maybe we can ship Leosar ecosystem. Another threat about the poaching is the uh, number of poaching still very high and kill so many elephants, so many uh, wildlife in in our forest. So this is the really threat for the biodiversity. I asked Greg how optimistic he was about the future of restoration efforts, and he believes that in many places, we've already passed the point of no return. We have to save every bit of what's left, you know, and that's not going to happen, I don't know, 20 years maybe at the most. But I don't know, there's places like Carinchi and, and Loser are so huge that they'll have more time than that. There's just, it's just too big. But irreparable in other places, maybe like, like where we are in Batang Teru and, and, and some of those other protected areas, maybe 15, 20 years. But you're saying that it's pretty much almost at that point already. Yeah, uh, yeah, sort of. I mean, you know, I hate to say that, but, it, but almost in a lot of places. The history behind how we got here is long, complex, and heartbreaking the finer details of which deserve their own dedicated explanations. Sumatra is the second largest economy in Indonesia, which is heavily dependent on palm oil. Much of this economic growth started in the 1980s, and through government encouragement of investors, has only driven further deforestation, monocropping, and mining that continues to this day, reducing acres of land that once had thousands of different plant species to simply one. In 1990s, when uh, Sumatra grew very fast, and it, um, the story might be in 1980s, 
So when the palm oil uh, grow and expand in Sumatra, there's so many forests in here and also the timber concession and mining because of the Sumatra is second largest economy in here uh, in Indonesia and so the economic growth very fast in here and uh, destroy all things in here. Government still think about uh, increasing the economy in our countries because we are from the middle middle uh, middle level of countries in the world and we need the uh, government need like uh, so many investors so many uh, capital operate in Sumatra but um, unfortunately uh, destroy many forests in here kill so many biodiversity and we lost the forest and in many places right now we can see there is no more forest there and change to be palm oil or open area ex mining or still uh, active mining there or even that is forest but really not forest because only one species there from the heterogen forest with a thousand species in one hectare to be only one species like an acacia this is for the timber concession or eucalyptus or another species so from the heterogen to be monoculture uh, forest in in sumatra so this happened and we only has the very small forest very small small in uh, several places with the lower biodiversity this is the the because of the economic growth in in sumatra only in leuser uh, we still has the uh, big forest even though under un, still under under trade but uh, better than another province mm. in sumatra around 1999 the indonesian government went through a period of decentralization and provinces were allowed more autonomy to govern themselves this includes forestry legislation and protection. The Aceh province, partially where the Loser ecosystem is located, was also concurrently going through its own conflict with the government of the Republic of Indonesia, which is titled the Free Aceh Movement. And while this slowed down development in the Loser ecosystem, Sumatra as a whole continued to develop. The government still thinking how we, they can open the area and they can, especially for the root construction, and government said or um, people community said they need a many root uh, construct in in Sumatra, and also across the the forest, and many plan. This is from the decentralization from the government uh, district or provincial government, and because they also has the budget, and they can open the road or changed uh, from the forest to be plantation by invite, invited, inviting the investor to visit and operate in, in the area. The Aceh province reached a peaceful agreement with the Indonesian government around 2005 in the form of a Memorandum of Understanding. And it is at this point that Rudy says development began to open back up, including proposed projects for roads, a hydro dam, and a geothermal power plant. So the conflict start in 2000 or 1999, and the top of the conflict in 2000, 2001, until 2004, and to the or 2005. One point, the conflict is good for the forest because there is no one can access the forest or operate in the forest uh, because that in that time is really danger in the forest. Only limited uh, operation in in our forest in that time. So, but uh, some of our field staff still operate, still working as usual, because we can contact with all of the parties, including Aceh Mofwan at the time. But after the conflict done in 2005, and the people, some of people back to their their land, and some of investors investor uh, reoperate their their concession and make the significant forest loss in in the ecosystem 
And until today, because of the government still planning to control like a route, and because there is no problem anymore with the Aceh movement and the forest safe, and they can operate. And we also has the problem with the, the planning for the well infrastructure, like a road and also hydrodyne or geothermal in the Leuser ecosystem. With everything that is occurring in Sumatra, one might think it can be difficult to keep track of where the biggest threat lies. But Rudy had a very clear answer for that. The biggest threat for forests is the road. From the road can invite so many things uh, destructive, like uh, from road and then investor will will come and invest for the palm oil or mining and then make a really sad area because uh, they kill all the uh, trees and change to be monoculture. And for the palm oil or timber concession, but timber concession only one concession or two concessions active in, in, in Aceh. For the palm oil, so many companies offer it around, around the Leucer ecosystem and also inside the Leucer ecosystem. And just like Rudy mentioned, Greg says a huge driver of deforestation to the area is the construction of roads, namely to supply projects like dams, and from these roads more plantations will appear. But unlike the Loser ecosystem, the Hatabuan Hills Dolok Sinalaksa landscape has no protection, and poachers have free reign, and the locals are afraid to interact with them. Because there is no centralized or enforced legal protection to many forests in Sumatra, guardianship is often left up to local residents who are under the consistent pressure of slipping into poverty, leaving them with very little options to stand up against illegal plantations, or poachers for that matter. Um, you know, surprisingly, well, most of the people in Sumatra who I know are also like, you know, conservation minded, they're into birds, you know, they're into wildlife, and, and they're actually really proud of, of their natural heritage. And, you know, this is su surprisingly a lot of conservationists in Sumatra, a lot of local people, you know, are really proud of, of their wildlife, and, and they want to protect it. Um, it. As far as the villagers go, I mean, you know, I think they'll tell you that they're on board for, you know, conservation, and some of them probably are, but, I mean, I think they're probably most afraid of, of being poor. You know, they're most afraid of poverty, which you have to understand. And so, and, and it's poverty that's going to you know, drive them to uh, poach, um, you know, to hunt t targeted species like the, uh, the helmeted hornbill and the Sunda pangolin, and to, you know, get involved in like agricultural encroachment. I mean, every time I go there, I feel like I'm, I'm cursed with this eye that's always scanning the horizon for signs of forest encroachment. I'm always looking to see where have they, you know, where are these palm oil plantations creeping a little bit farther up the mountain from last year? Um, where, where are there new patches of clearance? I'm always looking for that. I mean, so th they'll tell you that, you know, if they don't do that, they can't eat. And another threat to this area is a, a Korean financed dam on the Bila River, which is going to flood. I mean, it's not going to really flood that much of the landscape itself. I mean, it's a pretty deep valley there, but uh, I mean, the, the valley is spectacular. And the problem is once the dam goes in, they're going to need access roads. Access roads are going to have to be built, and those access roads are going to be used um, to establish more palm oil plantations and as the place is only like a like a watershed protected forest I mean that's its only status there's no like patrol I mean there's no there's no one out really to stop anyone from doing anything <laughs> the only thing that protects the wildlife there is just the steepness of the terrain it's really rugged and it's difficult to get around in but you know there are hardcore poachers. I mean, and they come from afar. I heard they come all the way from Jambi in South Sumatra, in South Sumatra province to go and hunt there. And, uh, you know, locals feel scared when they run into them in the forest. They see, you know, three guys with guns um, who are strangers. Um, they, they kind of don't really do much about that. And I, I understand. But that's one of the things we want to do is try to get a kind of reporting system in place. For Sumatra, the driver for this deforestation isn't just the economic incentives, but also the ever-increasing global demand for the products they produce. Uh, why 
this happen because of the demands of the world for the palm oil is really high and the impact is uh, forest loss because uh, we need the uh, new land for the new concession palm oil concession one such project made its way into the loser ecosystem in 2007 Despite there being Indonesian law that prevents development in a loser ecosystem of this kind, the Indonesian government has been granting permits anyway. Until 2007, some new company opened the land in, in loser ecosystem, and we tried to, keep, to, to stop this operation. But right now it's much better. Not so many companies uh, opened the land in, in loser, but still, still happen with a very small number. But they have they has the license from government because government said this can use for the palm oil or or another use another uh, or mining and they have the permit but as our perspective this government cannot release the permit inside of the leosa ecosystem because of the indonesian law said leosa ecosystem must be protected in 2006, a law called Autonomy for Acha was supposed to prevent any new development permits in the Loser ecosystem, but since that time, new permits have been granted and roads have been constructed. In 2001, the governor of Acha released a plan to open up the province to 16 new roads, specifically in the Loser ecosystem. The government stopped temporarily, but didn't really, and since then, 10 new roads have been constructed. So, the original plan since many years ago, I think in 2001, the governor of Aceh at that time released the, the plan to open around the 16 new route in Leuser ecosystem. So after so many protests from the activists, conservationists, the government stopped for the temporary, but this is not really stopped. Slowly but slowly, but uh, every year they allocate the funding for open this uh, this route until this year and right now almost but not all but almost uh, i think around the 10 or less than 10 new route in leucer ecosystem contracted the problem here cannot be overstated but the way out rudy argues is from communicating something quite simple 25 million people depend upon these forests for their livelihood, and very few people understand that losing the forest means losing their water. So our challenge, how we can save the 25 million people in, in Sumatra, and we will lose the, our water in the future, or we cannot control our water in the future. And today, in many places in Sumatra, we lost the water in the dry season and flooding in, in the rain season. This is a massive no. And we had to talk to many, many people in Sumatra and also in our earth. Only save the forest will save the people. And in Sumatra, it's really critical. If no forest, there is no water. And people must be uh, know and understand about this. And everyone understand if agree if no water they cannot live but there is very few people understand if no forest no water so this is our challenge the people must be careful about the environmental and government must be allow the rules for the environmental they have to protect their mining forest in sumatra and in many countries we can see this is the the world is changed so many reforestation in China or India or in Vietnam or another countries in the world. But in here, we can see the trends of the deforestation. So this is really our challenge as the conservationists in, in Sumatra. Secondly, Rudy says that it is crucial that they change the minds of politicians to care more about the environment. And also another challenge, how we can change the politician to care about environmental because they have the power. They have the power and they can change their, their regulation and they can change their mean about the environmental. And if we can win, if we can friendly with the environmental, uh, with the government, I think we can save the, 
remaining forests and restore the forests in, in Sumatra. Despite these challenges, Rudy is still optimistic that we can save the Loser ecosystem due to the conservation efforts done over the past 12 or 11 years. They continue to see some population growth of tigers, orangutans, and rhinos in the area. I'm still optimistic. We can save the Loser. Maybe need around 10 or 20 or 50 years later. But the point, we can see that is the, in many places in our, our work, we success to restore the many forests. So this is really hope. And also for the um, wildlife population, we can see this, the trend of the growing the population of the sound species in here. Even though we lost so many birds because of our harvesting or poaching. But in some species, we can be optimistic the population is growing right now, like a tiger, orangutan, and, and rhino. But this is not for the whole ecosystem in Sumatra. Uh, in separate places, we can see this, uh, the trend of the uh, population growth. So this is really hope. And I believe in Leuser because of we need this Leuser, not about the, the Leuser need someone or government, but we really need Leuser for our life in here. On a similarly positive note, Greg is currently involved in a project that links various forested regions with a proposed corridor that will provide a pathway for animals to travel from one region to another. As deforestation has left Sumatra sparsely forested, it is difficult for animals to migrate. Typically, plantation or landowners set snares for animals to keep them away or to kill them. Greg and PRCF is encouraging them not to and to let them pass by. Well, it's because there's all these forested mountain ranges there, but there's gaps between them. I mean, there's no, it's not, you know, there's no continuous forest linking them all. Um, but there's all this really high quality forest on the upper slopes of these mountains in the region. So there's like the Hadabon Hills, Dolaksa, Malalaksa, there's Batang, Teru. And then even between them, there's several other ranges, which I don't even, I mean, I'm sure there are local names for them, but I don't even know the names to them. And but so what's in between them is not really there's not cities or anything like that. It's all just plantations, either rubber plantation or oil palm plantations, or maybe some small scale plantations of other some other crops or whatever. And wildlife can actually use those. They they can cross through it. So I think um, you know one of our guys who's who's working on this is this guy named Sinan. Um, he's working for a. Uh, um, PRCF, and um, he's, his background is in agroforestry, and I think we want to find a way to work with local people, so maybe, maybe to put a little bit more variety in the crops in, in some areas, and to let, and for, to encourage local people to let, to allow wildlife to pass through these areas and without setting snares, and without getting, you know, setting snares like defensively, you know, because they're afraid of, you know, tigers, or, um, you know, or just setting snares for pig or deer, to hopefully use these um, plantation areas, which are between the mountains, as actual corridors. And um, I think it can be done. And as far as I know, camera traps set up in um, palm oil plantations have found a kind of a surprising variety of wildlife. And there's pigs going there, deer, leopard cat, lots of primates. Um, tigers go in there too, and, uh, either to follow pigs because, because there are pigs in there, or some of, sometimes there's just, when baby tigers start to grow up, they need to disperse from their, uh, you know, from their, where, from where their mother is, and um, there's really not any suitable forest for them to go to, so they end up going into these palm oil plantations. But hopefully if they, they can keep going and go to the next mountain range, where there might be a tiger or two, and then all the way on to Batang Teru, and then like, you know, the genetic pool increases, and then hopefully we get more tigers and you know more biodiversity, and th and then in that case, these um, these rubber plantations and oil palm plantations um, are not harming wildlife as much as they could, and we, and we incorporate them. It is encouraging to note that in the Loser ecosystem over the past decade of reforestation efforts, Rudy and his team have seen increased wildlife populations and decreased numbers of snares found. But the point we can see in 10 years ago, there is, or 12 years ago, there is no deforest reforestation in here. But right now we start and we success. 
and we increase the protection of the wildlife and we can see the increasing the population and the number of the threat for the wildlife right now is really lower than three or four years ago. And last year in 2019, we only find 241 of the snare in Lewisir ecosystem. In 2018, we collect 1,000 around the 60 of the snare. The effort for the protection is quite quite high now, uh, but we need government support to stop the plan for the destructive of Lewisir ecosystem and also how we can increase in the strength of the law enforcement in the Lewisir ecosystem. Greg did mention that in the five years he's been camera trapping, he thankfully hasn't seen populations decrease, but rather hang on. Like Rudy, what he fears most is continued habitat destruction. I, I get those sparks of hope when I see our camera traps, and I see that there's still so much wildlife out there. I'm taking a train or driving a car around the landscape. It's, it's hard to feel optimistic because you're just gonna, it's just endless, endless, endless um, oil palm. Um, I could say that just, I get hope from our camera traps. I know animals are still there and I, I would be really, I would have a lot more hope if they somehow cancel that dam in, in Batang Taru and, and also cancel the dam in, um, in, the, in our landscape in, in Dolaksa on the, on the Bila River. Maybe that could be you know, a benefit of COVID. You know, I heard that the, the workers had to go home, that you know, product, construction has come to a halt, and hopefully this buys us some time and they can reevaluate. I think the reports that there's still so much wildlife, that's the hope. There are still proposed hydro dam projects in Loser, and Rudy is adamant that they have to be stopped. He argues that hydroelectric power is entirely unnecessary when there are other sources that are less harmful to the environment that could be used, namely that of solar energy. But the government says it's too expensive. Still, the, our main, child, main threat for Loser is road. Um, government still controls the road in Loser, new road, and, or they said it's all road, and several road will will boil in Lewisir ecosystem. And the second, hydrodam and several hydrodam will construct in Lewisir ecosystem. This is really big, big dam they will operate in Lewisir. There's so many things in Lewisir if many dam operate. Can it be stopped? We have to. Uh, we don't need the, the dam in, in big dam in Aceh. There is so many a source of the energy in here in Indonesia almost 12 hours per day we have the freeze from energy from sun why governments didn't think how oh, they can capture uh, this uh, energy from sun this is really cheap and uh, simple and easy to offer why we need to big them with the very big environmental impact and destroy the forest so then, is there any solar companies or solar projects that, I mean, that have tried to approach this, the Indonesian government to, to offer an alternative? Yeah, I think several companies, but it's, it's very slow and also very small. I think we have the very potential, this huge potential for the solar energy from the solar. But the government said, or, or the investor said, it's still expensive. And in many countries, we can see this is very efficient. It's quite obvious that we need to find alternatives to these big development projects. But even more importantly, Rudy wants everyone to be aware of how the demand for raw materials and goods has an effect on the landscape and land use of other countries, not just Sumatra, emphasizing how we are all connected, and that when we demand for products such as palm oil or beef, we will have to keep clearing more land. Rudy's message is simple. We must control our consumption. How the, the people around the world have to care about the loser? Not only about the loser, but also, um, I mean, this remaining forest. And whole impact of the, the demand of the raw material from many countries impact to the, our forest. Because right now, all of the countries, all of the people right now connected each other. We import, we import so many kind from, including from US, 
uh, we import soya from US, we import, import beef from Brazil, from the Australia, we export the, our palm oil from here. We export so many gold or bauxite or many things. If we still keep uh, our demand high, and higher, higher, and every year uh, increase, that means we need the new land or new area or extract so many kind from our earth for the consume of the people in, in, in the world. So we have to care about this. We have to control our consume because that's really direct impact to environmental. And we can see right now so many rubbish in our earth so many unuseful material right now in our earth because we consume a lot and we have to control we have to reduce our consume for the better life in in our earth greg wanted everyone to take more chances on investing in unprotected areas and encourage ngos and donors to pay more attention to the hadabwan deluxe landscape citing that many organizations are hesitant to put their money into a region that doesn't have as much support and he wanted everyone to think differently about this you know i just i, I wish that this place got a little bit more a- attention you know i, I think it get, i wish it got some more conservation investment i think you know a lot of ngos tend to kind of pile in on one place and like, um, you know, where there is one NGO, maybe donors feel it's safer to invest in that place because there's others, you know, so the, okay, three big, three big groups are working here in Loser. That's a safe place to go. It becomes a case of a like money follows money. You know, there's, others have invested there, others are working, okay, so let's do that too. Let's all, and then it just seems, I guess it seems safer or more attractive to, um, you know, funding, you know, donors and stuff. And I wish they would uh, be a little bit more, you know, open-minded and a little more um, brave about, a little more understanding maybe when they, when they decide who gets funding and, and who doesn't. Um, you know, sometimes I feel like they've, you know, we've had, you know, we've been declined for funding before and I felt like the, the reasons just sounded like excuses. One point Greg made that stood out to me is about the relationship between the Sumatran people and the animals that inhabit the forest. Even an apex predator, like the tiger, has a complex relationship that benefits villages in ways you may not readily realize. And losing that isn't just a disruption of biodiversity and resources, but also of the culture of the people that live there. Um, A lot of local people kind of revere some of these tigers which live near the village. They, one of them, is the, you know, the word for tiger in Indonesian is a herimau, herimau. And then the, they have what's called the herimau nunga, which is they call the, the waiting tiger or the village tiger or our tiger. And um, we, they, we, this one village, which is remote and up in the mountains, they told us there was a tiger on a ridge line, which was like one or two kilometers away. You can see it clearly from right from the middle of the village. Um, I mean, it's close enough, it seems like you could reach out and touch it. And we, we were skeptical of this. So we put a camera trap up there. In two weeks, we got the tiger. And they say that, the, and the, I guess this is kind of scientific, the, the tiger protects the village in the sense that it keeps out other tigers and it, um, it scares away flocks of pigs so that um, they're not always raiding their rice farms and raiding their crops. So it actually kind of keeps other wildlife in check. And so for this reason, they, they don't persecute that tiger. They know the ridge line, they know the trail. They won't set traps there for it, even for deer, because they don't want to mess with that tiger um, because he's on their side. He's on their team. And more than that, you know, sometimes the tiger roars. And, of course, when, when he roars, the people get scared. They go in and they lock the, the doors of the house. But the village elder claims to be able to interpret these roars. And he, sa- he says that, you know, the roar from the tiger is a form of advice that he's giving to the village. Um, you know, like if, if people are having problems, their marital problems or health problems or whatever kind of problem they're having, he can interpret it and tell the local people what the tiger is trying to tell them to do. It always heartens me that they have these, these are kind of like, I don't know, animist beliefs, at least some kind of pre-Islamic belief. And um, they're able to harmonize that well with their official religion, and nobody questions it. And uh, 
that 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 um, gives me some hope. The answer to my last question to Rudy was difficult for me to hear, as I asked him what he loved most about Sumatra, and he said that if many people could see how beautiful the landscape is, they would cry. Not only is Sumatra important because of its biodiversity, but because of the fresh air that supplies to the surrounding countries and to the world. But his parting words were not just to protect Sumatra, but remaining forests everywhere, and to restore the ones that have been cleared. Leoser is green. It's beautiful forest here. Leoser ecosystem is around three times of uh, Yellowstone ecosystem in U.S. This is popular. And Leoser ecosystem uh, similar than 35 times of Singapore. This is huge and beautiful forest in here. If you fly from Medan, the biggest city in Sumatra, to Banda Aceh, that is one hour flight. If you're lucky in the clear air, you can see this really green, green everywhere. It's beautiful here. And it have to protect this forest. We need everyone in, in the world care about the mining forest, beautiful forest. And I believe m- many people will cry if they can see this is really green to everywhere. And also biodiversity here. This is really important for us. The Leoser, not only the, for the local people in here, fresh air from the Leoser ecosystem uh, distribute to many, many countries, so to many, many uh, people in maybe in Malaysia or Singapore, Thailand, or everywhere, because we only have the one air in our earth. We have to protect this forest. And my message is not only in Leoser, but everywhere remaining trees stand in in our earth. We have to protect them and we have to restore destroyed forests, destroyed forests to be forests. I believe we still have time to save our earth. I'd like to personally thank both Rudy Putra and Greg McCann for contributing to this introductory episode and for their scientific expertise and their bravery in protecting the critically threatened biodiversity and forests on the island of Sumatra. Manga Bay Explorers is an ongoing podcast series diving into environmental stories from around the globe. Be sure to check out our previous episodes, one through six, to learn more about the history of the looming salamander bee cell pandemic and the efforts to identify it in the wild. Download our new app for Apple and Android devices to gain fingertip access to new shows in all our previous episodes. We also ask that if you enjoyed the show, please tell a friend. That's the best way to help expand our reach and keep growing. Watch for a new edition of Manga Bay Explorers every two weeks, in between episodes of our flagship podcast, The Manga Bay Newscast. Special projects like this are made possible by our Patreon supporters. Manga Bay is a nonprofit news provider, so we rely on the generosity of our listeners, readers, and friends. To add your support, head to patreon.com forward slash manga bay to learn more. Keep up with all of Manga Bay's news from Nature's Frontline at mangabay.com or get updates via Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, where our handle is at manga bay. Thank you once again. And we'll be back soon with another episode of Manga Bay Explorers.